Hi, welcome to our place up in Alpine National Park, um, up along the Bundara River and um, Calligan's Road up at Angler's Rest. And um, hopefully you'll find this a little bit interesting um, on this new format, digital format, because of COVID. Um, so here's just going to go through things as they went along uh, uh, on the progress of our building. Uh, it was a pretty darn rough 12 and a half acre block. As you can see, super rocky, super steep, really thick with um, brush, and um, mostly Malaluca, leafy bassia, Kunzia. Couldn't even see the river from our um, site um, until we cleared the brush. Uh, first, we had uh, some roads built, and uh, we built a kit shed. We lived upstairs of it and used the bottom as a work shed, uh, half as a work um, working shed and half as our living space. This is the upstairs. And um, finally, we were ready to design and build the house. So what we did was I got this book called A Pattern Language, which I really recommend for those of you who are really into um, reading deeply. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of um, dog-eared pages and um, notes that I put into that book when I was designing the house. It's, it's quite interesting, but it's only for those who really want to dig in deep um, about how to design a space, whether it be a, a country, a city, a neighborhood, um, a block. Then he gets down to um, your front yard, your backyard, then he gets down to all the diff different inside spaces and what you want to do in terms of um, how to design views and feeling and all kinds of stuff. So it's not for everybody, but that's what we use to build our space, design our space. Once I had it designed, um, rather than pay an architect, I just did it myself, but um, I knew it would pass through council um, faster if I had a trusted engineer. So we actually paid a couple of thousand bucks for an engineer to actually draw up the plans. And, and as expected, the council um, passed it really quickly. Then we got around to building the, the house site itself, which was uh, rather interesting and fun and, um, and took well, probably th two or three years to actually get a roof over the, our heads. But you can see what kind of a rough spot it is. And I had some friends that I paid to help me um, put it together. And of course, when you pour cement or build a house until you get the roof on, it pours rain every day. But we finally did it. And once the roof was on, we um, continued onwards and um, started doing the interior work and all the railings and and um, oiling the um, red cedar um, window and door frames from Canada. Nobody told us that parrots love to eat that stuff, but the sea toil oil we put on stopped the parrots from in, uh, eating it. And now we have this amazingly beautiful house attached to the shed. So um, we can take you on a little walkthrough, and here's, here's kind of walking around it and looking at it from the outside views. And now you can walk up the ramp from the driveway and along the long deck, we call it. And uh, once you get uh, to the end of that, you're looking down at the river the whole time. And there's Mount George, which uh, is to our, directly to our north, and that's uh, east of us. Uh, which is where most of our weather comes from. There's the long deck from the lower deck. And um, that's the typical rainbows we often get. And there's the lower deck. Um, another view. And there's our breakfast deck. And, um, and then stepping back to where the greenhouse is, you can see the shed and uh, the decking. And now into the inside, here's our dining room. There's our kitchen. And we um, designed the kitchen to fit my five foot tall wife. And uh, there's looking from the dining room back towards the rest of the house. Uh, bathroom's on the right, bedroom's in the back there. Um, I designed the shower heads so that we could both take a shower at the same time. There's the composting toilet. We'll talk about that later. There's the bedroom. 
Uh, this is the pantry, which used to be part of the shed. I just knocked a hole in the wall um, for the shed, and you can get into the pantry directly from the kitchen. And this was also part of the shed. I've taken about a third of the shed and made it to Carrie's office. There's the beautiful stove, best uh, wood stove on earth, made of um, semi-tractor trailer brake drums. And um, we redesigned it so that it really works well. If you're interested in the particulars, um, especially how we um, put a little um, cap on the bottom of the flue so you can actually clean the flue with a flue brush from within the shed if you really need to, all the way up with a flexible rod all the way up to the roof. But um, yeah, go ahead and um, contact me if you want more details on that particular wood stove. That's a really nice old front loader. It's a whirlpool. It's, uh, you know, if you don't use hot water, if you're just always washing cold, <laughs> super nice and um, takes almost no energy, really super easy. And that's an instantaneous hot water heater and, uh, powered by gas bottles outside. And that's just for the upstairs where we used to live, but when we were building the house, now we don't even need it, so it's off. Um, unless we have guests upstairs because, hey, we guess what? We got the solar hot water heater with the wood heater water jacket back up for wintertime. So, uh, and then the gas boost in case we really don't have either of those because I always want a hot shower no matter what. Bye. And from the shed, um, that's Carrie's office there in the corner of the shed. You can lock the shed off from her office. Um, you can go up the stairs, and this is where we lived for 10 years while I was... Uh, we were off working overseas and then building the house. It's a lot nicer now than when we actually lived in it, but now it's a, a granny flat sort of slash rental unit. And it also has uh, another composting toilet. We'll get into that later. Um, portable style composting toilet. And the, this is upstairs of the shed, a little unit we have for rental. And the flue just goes right up through this room and heats this room as well. So there's only one stove for the shed and this room. So just a quick walk around. That's a shade tarp for the um, summertime. And uh, there's our uh, sprinklers for the deck. It gets all the walls, all the wooden walls, which are hardwood, and they're sealed as well. So they're pretty fire resistant, even though they're wood. Um, dual pane glass. Um, there's the river from our deck, the best deck on earth, I call it. Um, and there's our lower deck. And there's um, where I came from, and there's the breakfast deck. And you can see the awnings um, that we put down for the summertime. Um, so that it keeps it cooler in the, in the, uh, when the sun's up. Um, and that awning there was built so that um, basically uh, in the wintertime we get good sun coming through the windows that warm the house and in the summertime um, the sun is shaded from the windows and we never have sun on the windows. Same thing with that um, awning that is, uh, you can drop or pull back up, same deal. It's, uh, it protects it in the summer and you can leave it up for the view in the winter. These uh, wood stoves with water jackets in the back of them, they really work great. Um, and the thermo siphon, you know, the plumbing needs to be done properly and not every plumber knows how to do it, I have found. So it's important to get the plumbing um, in right, you know, where the cold water comes in the bottom and the hot water flows out the top just because of the heat exchange. But uh, they work super great and they're a great backup to a hot water solar system on the roof when it's really cloudy for a long time and or cold in wintertime. And these um, fans um, are awesome. As you can see, they're blowing the heat out really well. And um, they work on a piezoelectric motor, which is that tiny little thing in the back there. And the base gets hot sitting on the stove. And then these fins are cooler drawing the cooler air through them and the difference in the temperature uh, coming into the wires uh, the hotter and the colder that um, actually creates electricity it's not just um, 
air passing through there. It's an actual electric fan. And the hotter the stove, the faster those blades turn. So we've got to move an air around in the house. It's really good. And here's the Edwards um, brand um, solar hot water heater with the wood stove hot water jacket. That's the overflow there. Um, for if you're starting to boil and increase the pressure, it just bubbles right out into that little box um, can, holding tank until things cool down a little bit and then that water will um, go back into the system. When you're living really remote, it's really hard to get contractors out there and um, good contractors, that's another level yet again. Uh, the first contractor we got out here to, we told it gets down to negative 8, negative 10, negative 14, and we need, really need to be um, careful with the lagging, and they didn't do a very good job. So that was kind of a difficulty that we had to deal with for two years where we had broken pipes until we um, made them change it, and then we fixed it up even more since then. Here's our great little kitchen. Um, Built, uh, we designed it ourselves and used cardboard boxes and to play play with the design to get heights and distances to walk between the stove and the sink. I do most of the dishes, so I insisted that the sink faced our company so that I could talk to them while I was doing the dishes. And as you can see, even though we're off grid, we've got the cappuccino maker, the toaster, the microwave, and the reason we we're able to do that is because we have the micro hydro uh, system. It's a really efficient uh, 420 liter refrigerator and um, all the lights, the refrigerator usually takes, the, is the most load in the uh, households and right after that is lights. But nowadays with LED lights and all of our lights are now LEDs, um, they were harder to get in the past, they're easy to get now, um, but but as you can see, um, you know, we've taken care of our biggest loads um, and um, don't have to worry about that. We also have um, phantom loads like normal, like everybody has, um, but the, we don't have to worry about them as much because we have the micro hydro and that's running 24 seven. Because we're off grid, we um, put the um chest freezer on a timer so that it's off during the night and when we or when we have less electricity and we also have the bottom line with ice in milk bottles so it barely takes any electricity at all. I uh, wanted to get a shower uh, for each of us so, so we could take a shower together but the, she could have the hotter water and like she likes it and I could have not so hot hot water like I like it and here's the composting toilet um, and it drops right through the floor and you'll see the other end of it in a minute. Um, and here's our, uh, our honeycomb blinds. Um, these ones are dual action. So you can lift the bottom and you can also drop the top. So you can have the bottom down for privacy while you still get light up at the top and you still have some insulation as well. So we have dual glazed glass um, on all our doors and windows and we have a lot of doors and windows. And so you have to, it's, a, it's kind of an art, not a science, you know, like if you want to have the warmest house possible, well then you'd have, you know, 12 inches of insulation everywhere and um, not have any light at all. So obviously you want light and you want the views there's our river way down there. So, you know, you have to um, mitigate all your desires and needs uh, so that it all fits in together into the big picture. Um, so we got the dual glazed windows um, and we also have these honeycomb blinds, dual honeycomb blinds for insulation. But if you look at this, the bottom is really wide and well insulated, but because it's so tall and so heavy that by the time you get to the top, it's much thinner. So that's something that you may not know or, they, or even the blind sellers uh, may not understand or know. So you really gotta get a high quality one that's strong enough not to, um, fall, uh, not to do what I, what I just showed you. Um, get super thin at the top and super thick at the bottom and 
um, or get maybe two sets so they're not quite so long and heavy, uh, different options. The other thing is the dual glazed gaps. So here's a gap that's much thinner. That looks like it's about four mil, five mil. And we got these ones later and this gap is obviously more like eight or 10 mil. So clearly that's better for insulation. Um, so, you know, the, we got these a long time ago, like what, whatever it was, eight, nine years, 10 years ago or more. So the company that we bought them from, they didn't bother to tell us there was different gaps you could get and they didn't think about it or maybe they didn't even have the wider gap. So that's something else that you need to consider is when you order your glass with the dual pane or triple pane, um, you really need to make sure that you know the gap that's involved and what kind of glass you're getting and um, all the other features. Another thing we had to think about was the lights in the closet. We wanted on a timer. Those um, things are pretty dang expensive, much more than they ought to be, but it's, uh, it's kind of on a pressure pump inside the, the, uh, the button there, so it, it times itself out so you, know, you forget to turn the closet light or something that's out of the way off, and that'll do it for you, but those bloody things are expensive. And here's the bedroom, honeycomb blinds, dual glazed glass everywhere. Um, and except we wanted drapes um, for our bedroom French doors and windows there. So we just got thick, um, well insulated drapes, um, you know, from Ikea, you can get them anywhere. And uh, those seem to do the trick. And you can use rolled up towels or just buy these things from, um, you know, inexpensively from stores or online. And that stops the drafts from under the doors. And of course you have the insulation in between the doors. You can do that for French doors as well as all the other doors. We have skylights everywhere, homemade skylights. Um, so you don't have to turn lights on all the time. There's a lot extra light, but it also lets the heat in in the summer and the cold in in the winter so um, you can get insulated skylights you can get honeycomb blinds that are on tracks that actually move back and forth in a horizontal fashion uh, you can get well insulated skylights um, you know you name it we just did this homemade but lots of options Now we'll get into one of the features of the house, which is uh, the microhydro uh, plus a little bit of solar backup, uh, just in case the hydro isn't working because of floods or debris or maintenance. Okay, so here's the battery room, and um, there's that cable. There is the wild AC coming up from the hydro which uh, can fluctuate all the way up to over 400 volts. And I already blew a couple of regulators up because of that. So what we ended up doing was um, putting it through this transformer so that nothing no, uh, over 120 volts ever comes out um, of this. And then out of the transformer, it goes into a rectifier to make it into DC. And then the DC wiring comes out of there and into the balance of system up there, which I'm gonna get into in a second. But while I'm down here on the floor, there's a really nice IOTA um, charger because I have one of the old style um, SEA um, Australian inverters that is not also a battery charger. So I needed a battery charger just for backup. So we got a Honda Jenny outside the back, which I'll show you in a second that just plugs into the back of this and then um, goes goes straight up into the um, regulating system there I'll show you in a second so that's the transformer okay so here's what the regulating and wiring systems look like um, uh, forget this little box down here for the moment this regulator, this um, Xantrex, is for the hydro, 
and you can see right now it's putting out um, nearly nine amps um, at 25.9 volts that's what the batteries uh, storage is at right now and then the Outback um, 60 here is um, showing what we're putting in with the solar um, which is nothing because the um, Sun just went down and then um, here's the old SEA um, workhorse inverter and then um, there's our batteries there 960 uh, amp hours worth of batteries um, because we have the hydro we don't need too much more although during the winter time when the Sun goes behind the mountain early uh, and if there's a flood on the river or too much debris coming down, which happens in the autumn, we actually do need a little bit more than we got. So that was a little bit of an undervalue. Um, there's our uh, sub panels, the main and sub panel for the house for the AC. And so we look in here and it looks like a dog's breakfast, but it's actually pretty simple. So, um, there's uh, the wires that are coming out of the hydro um, go basically straight into the rig the back of the Xantrax and then out of the Xantrax it goes through a circuit breaker and then um, over to the batteries and then um, the Jenny which is coming out of the IOTA battery charger there um, that goes through a circuit breaker and then goes yeah back over to the batteries um, and the negative um, bus there. And then um, you can see that's where the batteries, those big cables there are coming in, positive and negative. And there's a couple of um, shunts there so that I can read what we're making um, and putting out. And then there's the, uh, let's see, what else do we got? A bunch of circuit breakers. There's a couple of DC circuit breakers here. Um, and those are for the toilet fans, the composting toilet fans. Um, and then, so there's very little DC in our house. And then um, this here is a relay, a solid state relay, because the uh, mechanical one kept clunking off and on. And basically what that does is, because um, on the solar panels, what everybody's used to is if there's no sun, there's just no generation of power and no, bit, no problem. But uh, when you're dealing with a hydro, that's a... Um, generator and it needs a load or it's going to freewheel and blow up and so uh, if the batteries are full um, that um, power generation needs to be diverted and so it's diverted into this one coil the second one has never been used in 20 years um, so um, it's a, just a heating coil and um, we've thought about changing that into a water heater but just haven't got around to it yet but in any case um, when the batteries are full, um, so we don't have to worry about the hydro, um, that uh, relay just shunts power into that um, into that radiant heater. And so um, you're seeing out of the um, regulators, um, the power is going into um, the fuse box and then into the batteries and then back out of the batteries and that's going back into this inverter and then the inverter sends the power the ac over to these sub panels and it goes out to the house pretty simple and all these other extra little doodads that there um, is uh, an effigy um, whole house load reader so i can see what um, the, the house is used uh, over, over time by day, by week, by month, by year, and it sends it to a website, and I just look at the website and I can see what the house has been doing, using. Um, and this here, this Schneider uh, Electric um, Connect Combox thing, that also sends information to the web, and that's what that's sending is the uh, hydro output. And so um, I'm seeing what the hydro reads without having to walk into the battery room um, on our website. And I'm also seeing what the house has been using and is using um, in real time if I want to. We have this little readout uh, next to the kitchen so that we don't have to go into the battery room all the time to just see uh, what the hydro is making. 
And here's a few um, shots of us building this epic construction project of building the hydro. We didn't want to ruin our beautiful little river uh, or stop kayakers from kayaking down it. So we tried to keep it off to the side and as discreet and inconspicuous as possible. Um, and I think we managed to do that. Um, the original design, which you can see there, uh, didn't allow for cleaning. Uh, it was very poorly designed, and when the river flooded, like, hey, there it is right there, um, it was actually underwater and useless. Uh, it was a nightmare, and I wrote an article about it in an American magazine, and then we got a, an offer t for a free unit from a guy in Nova Scotia, um, to replace it. So if we wrote an article about how great his unit was, and so we did that, and now we have a really great little unit, but we're kind of stuck with the location. So screening um, the debris that comes out of the river uh, is the biggest problem you'll find in any hydro system. And um, it is what it is sort of with ours. It's too late and I'm not going to redo the entire system. But if you're going to do a hydro, talk to me first because that is the biggest detail you need to pay attention to. And these, this is the new unit we got sent over from um, Nova Scotia and we're getting ready to install it and you'll see some more pictures, videos actually of that um, coming up in the next um, segment. So now we got steps and it's about as good as it's going to get and we actually teach students about microhydro and how it works. And here's some outside views. There's the solar panels, some really old ones there catching the east sun. And there's those um, DC to DC maximizers in the backs of the panels that allows us to get plenty of power even when it's um, cloudy outside, which is um, something else you could ask me about. There's our drive-in shed and there's our wood shed. Just some outside shots. So there you can see our shed. And um, you know, there's the UHF antenna and there's the Yagi antenna, uh, which will get a lucky bounce off of that mountain way over there, which gets a lucky bounce from way over there, about 11 Ks away, uh, Omeo, which is where the closest mobile towers are. Um, so we get a very minimal signal, but with that Yagi antenna and then the booster inside, we're actually getting mobile phone service. There's our hot, uh, wood-fired hot tub, and there's Carrie's greenhouse. Way up there is two 
um, if you can see them, two uh, 22,000 liter um, storage tanks, which we pump water from our river when we need it. And it lasts, that lasts us four months in the winter. But when Carrie's watering the garden and the greenhouse in the summer, it only lasts maybe a month and a half. If you're going to live in the bush, you've got to be prepared for fire. That's just what happens in Australia or anywhere where there's trees, actually. We went through the 03 fires, and um, they were right over our heads. Hurricane of fire through our property. But because we made our property defendable, um, we didn't burn like that. We had actually survived. So we always do fuel reduction burns, and we always have protection ready in case it gets out of control. Um, you got to be prepared to do that and, and really be diligent about it. Take the time, take the money, take the energy. No excuses. I mean, we, we live in the bush because we love the bush, but that doesn't mean you have to be living cheek by jowl with super flammable um, deck furniture and or bushes, which is really where it burns. And for bushfire, um, um, as you can probably see, we do have a lot of trees, which is we really love. But we've thinned them into a quote-unquote park-like spacing. So uh, we went through the 03 fires, and you can see our video of fighting the fires and actually in 03. And it was a hurricane of fire blew right through our place and over our heads. And we were fine because of this, of what we did. And I'm telling you, it took 20 years of clearing and brush burning and fuel reduction burns and taking down, um, spacing the trees well um, to make it a super defendable property. Um, but you got to do that or, you know, no excuses. If your house burns down because you didn't clear the property, um, you got nobody to blame but yourself. Sorry. Um, we do love our trees, but you got to be a responsible person as well. So you can see there's no very little ground cover. Um, we're waiting for it to dry out a little bit to get the little bit of uh, ground cover. Um, uh, we'll burn that soon. Um, but you can see what we've already done around the upper shed here, the parking garage, quote unquote, um, fuel reduction burn. And that gets us ready for summer so that the shed will be protected. We don't have to worry about that. You can see I've taken down a spare branch down there in a trunk, and we'll uh, put that up in the near the woodshed, which is right there. You can see there's tons of wood left over from the, uh, we're nearly over with, uh, with the winter already. Um, and we'll let that dry for a couple of years, and then we'll use that. But as you can see, really defendable property. Um, you can also see the mountain to our north. So in the winter time, we don't get a whole lot of sun, which is one of the main reasons we ended up getting the um, hydro. Um, so while everybody else is having to rely on their Jenny and waking up to, um, you know, batteries below 22 and, you know, having to turn the generator on and they've got no power, um, except for when there's a lot of leaves uh, in the river or when the river is flooding, we don't have that issue. There's our solar, solar panels. Uh, there's eight of the 12 panels. Uh, we've only got like 1.8 or 9 kilowatts in that, and that's all we've needed. And then you can see the um, satellite uh, dish for the, um, for the NBN, for SkyMuster. And it's not a regular satellite dish. It doesn't just ca passively collect uh, information like a TV does. This is actually sending out microwaves um, so that there's uploads and downloads from the satellite. So if you get one of these things, be prepared because it's taking at least an amp and a half on our 24 volt system. Um, so that's a big load. So just think about it. And then um, kind of sloppy look and there's a little um, blanket we've put over the um, hot water heater that I haven't taken off yet, but you can see the hot water here, 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 and there's an explanation in the pictures. And there's a rainwater catchment, and um, yep. Sorry, it's already nighttime, and um, so not worrying. That's why you got a torch here looking at this, but that's just a simple UHF for the household. I'll show you the antenna outside, and so this is for fires. Um, if 
that's so we can communicate with each other within the valley when there's a big fire like we've had in 03 and recently in 2020 because hey guess what our communications to the world go out because some telstra wire gets blown up or burnt and um you know we're running around like maniacs and our so are our neighbors trying to save our own properties and so it's good to have a way to talk to each other so we have a home-based uhf that talks to everybody that's on the road within the valley okay this is um our little rock stairway down to our wood-fired hot tub and um, there's obviously a little lid for insulation and some packing material and a thermometer it's enough for you know you could squeeze four in there but we just use it for the two and we haven't worried about drilling holes for um, pumps or anything we just use the old witch's stirring spoon and this is the snorkel stove so there's the baffle there and the air goes straight down there to the bottom which is pretty deep and then it goes out the back and up the flue and heats the water and there's there's little holes that go through the tubes of steel that go through the um, stove itself but I don't really know that it works that well so we just leave this open when we're getting it hot and burning and then when we uh, want to just let it settle and simmer for the night we just go fill it up and do that and then in the morning it's still 42 degrees which is really nice really nice to have on a nice cold winter day Okay, here's our upstairs compact um, toilet from Sunmar, and uh, don't be scared. Um, that's the bin where you uh, go into, and when you're ready to rotate it, that's how you rotate it until you get back to where it's open again. And then eventually the compost, composted human manure. Uh, do that again, put you. Thank you. Yeah. There drops into that tray and you just bring the tray down to the garden and or wherever you want to put it in the soil thanks okay we're under the house now this is where the main toilet chute drops down into the Sunmar from nature Lou. this is how you rotate that drum you can hear it looks like a cement mixer inside and um, there's a fan uh, that blows um, the smell, the sucks the smell from the bathroom through the toilet and then back up the stink pipe above the roof. And there's the, the uh, drop and this is for access if you need to uh, maintain anything. And, um, there's a couple of trays under here where you, you get compost dropping in. Um, and then the, there's a finishing tray there and you know when you're rotating it all the f finished soft and light fluffy manure uh, compost and ends up in that finishing tray and then you just take that little um, tray out to your garden or wherever you're going to put the compost and there's all kinds of uh, different uh, opinions on um, how often to turn this and how much to turn it um, how many turns do you do carrie 70. She does this 70 times, 70 rotations a day, every day. And we were told once a week, we were told two or three times a week, we were told every other day. It's changed over 10 years, numerous times, but we got, contacted the people in Canada who make this thing where it gets really cold like it does here. Um, we've had negative eight this year already over, over the um, um, nighttime. And you can see that this is an insulated box that holds the entire unit. Um, and uh, they said, yeah, the more you rotate it, the better it can be. And there's a, there's a recipe for how much moisture uh, you want in there and how much sawdust. And we've used enzymes and not used enzymes. It seems like you could go either way on that. So it's definitely an art, not a science. 
Um, but in the winter time, it doesn't get so dry dry enough in here. And but we found that the electric um, radiant we found that the radiant heater uh, takes too much power that's built into this unit. So I just um, put together an, an incandescent light bulb, the old style workshop light bulb, and we just leave the light bulb on when there's sun. Um, out and there's plenty of power or the hydro and or the hydro is going and that warms up the box just enough to dry out the compost. There you have it. Gray water system is pretty simple. Um, just basically collects all the wastewater that's not going through the composting toilets into that, um, that grease trap down there. It's um, and it, uh, the grease gets trapped in that tank and then it goes out into the French drain that we um, dug in the hillside and uh, hey guess what it's supposed to be a reed bed and <laughs> there's reeds there nowhere else on the whole property are there reeds except for right in the French drain so that's pretty good if you notice that bent inspection pipe just to the right of the base of that brittle gum out there um, that was melted in the 03 fires several ways to pump water um, we don't have a bore obviously we have a river so that makes it kind of easy except that it floods sometimes so we have to time when we are going to pump and think about whether it's going to be raining or snow melting, etc. Um, that's why we did decided not to get um, one of the nice new solar pumps that don't take any petrol or sound, you know, really loud um, or pollute the atmosphere. It's just that uh, we have farmers upstream and we're not real sure when they're spraying uh, and also when a flood's coming, so I want to make sure I'm, I'm the one that's deciding when we're pumping. So we just stuck with the old style fire pump. And then um, up the hill there, you can see the 44,000 gallons of, sorry, 44,000 liters, wrong country, um, of storage that we have. So it, it's attached to the hot water, not the cold water, which was a mistake that a plumber could, a professional plumber did and could easily make. So you attach it to the hot water that's coming out of the solar hot water on the roof. And if the solar hot water coming in is, a, is hot enough, this doesn't go on. It doesn't use any gas to boost it. Um, and in the wintertime, if, if the hot water coming out of the solar hot water that's being heated by the, um, the, the j water jacket in the wood stove through thermosiphoning, if that is hot enough, then again, the boost doesn't go on. And then triple redundancy, if neither of those is working properly and the hot water going in here is not hot enough, the thermostat turns on the gas and the, that turns on and um, we always have a hot shower. So here's Carrie's Sproutwell um, greenhouse. And uh, it's like, I think it's like three by six meters. Double door to enter. This is, um, 10 mil thick uh, insulated polycarbonate that's darn cold out there but um, really beautiful inside and you know like I say we've been having um, minus two minus four it went down to minus eight and it hasn't killed anything in here um, so you know here we are in the middle of July and uh, those are automatic louvers on that side with gas struts so if it gets too hot they automatically open and then we just put manual ones on this side just in case we need those and then I also put um, two barrels uh, wheelie bins of water in here for thermal mass so it makes it last you know keeps it warm by another degree or two um, every night when it gets super cold and that seems to have done the trick And that's a pretty simple composting um, area. I put the compost in there to start working it and then the barrel. And then we, uh, once it's already worked pretty good, we throw it in there and just dig it up a little bit and turn it and uh, it turns into the perfect compost. I know that's kind of funny looking, but uh, it's been hard to find a good insulation when it gets to be 14 below C. Um, in our mountainous area here in uh, the northeast northeast Gippsland in the Alpine Park So we just cover it with foam and so far we've got to eight below this winter and so far so good um, And that's just the Telster box, but that there is the um, caravan plug um, That the Jenny is plugged into and on the other side you've already seen 
um, the um, IOTA battery charger um, so that we can charge the batteries. There's our two um, gas tanks and there's a dual regulator there so even when one runs out the other one is still operating so we never run out of gas and then there's the Honda Jenny, that Jenny that's all we ever need really and it's super quiet and we just have it there just you know in case thanks hope you enjoyed it I'm um, rather unprofessional I'm sure but um, you know hopefully you saw what you needed to see and uh, any questions you feel free to just contact us anytime have a good day. Cheers. Bye.